how do we get to know you better? This session is something that we've reintroduced from about, ooh, I don't know, maybe we used to do it seven or eight years ago on a regular basis. And it is our way of um, getting to know the vast majority of groups in this region that we don't have the staff capacity or the time to meet with on an individual basis. And so um, because we are distinctive from private foundations, it's, in, it's important for us to know who you are and what you're doing. It's also important for you to know how we operate and how we are different from um, your typical private foundation like the Meyer or Peace or any of the other kind of private philanthropic organizations in the region. So we're gonna start off with a round of introductions and go straight into the agenda. I am Angela Jones Hasley and no hyphen. Um, <laughs> people hyphen and no hyphen. Um, I am the vice president of community investment. Some of the same kind of um, job responsibilities, and my role is to oversee our uh, discretionary grant making, meaning that the, the investments that we make in the community on the ground at a regional level. We have a good number of staff here today, both from our local affiliates as well as the regional office. So I'll have them introduce themselves first. And the expectation is that while I will lead most of the conversation this morning, they can chime in. They're the ones who probably know a lot more than I do about most of the things that are happening here. <laughs> um, and so they can chime in to add additional kind of content where um, I may not have it all. So um, I'll have them introduce themselves, starting with Anna. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Hargrave, Deputy Director of the Community Foundation for Montgomery County, one of our two affiliates. I'm Benton Murphy. I'm a Senior Philanthropic Services Officer here at the Downtown Slash Regional Office. Bomadi Johnson, I'm the director of the DC office here at the Community Foundation. What is that? That means I work primarily with our donors who uh, live and give in the district, uh, making sure that, that all of their kind of customer services are met. Uh, my name is Sydney Golden, and I do communications work. And I'm Katie Neely, and I'm the communications intern for the summer. Good morning. I'm Ina Anderson with the Community Foundation for Prince George's County. Hi, I'm Rosie. Um, I'm your operations associate with the DC office. Um, just wanted to alert you that this session is being taped this morning. We're trying something out to see if we can get good enough uh, resolution, <coughs> good enough content that we might be able to post this on the web. We got um, this, when we sent the e-blast out, we were quite surprised that within um, 10 minutes or so, we were at capacity and we had to turn a good number of folks away. So we do have um, a plan to have this session repeat itself in September and December and then throughout next year to the extent that people are still interested in knowing about us um, as well. So you guys were the fastest ones to get on the <laughs> list and there are people clamoring saying, how can I get on this? Uh, but I will say that this really is an informational session. It is not tied to any grant round that we have open. It is not required that you come to any of these sessions to be eligible for any grant round. Um, it will not give you a leg up or, or otherwise if you attend. Um, it really, really is our way of getting to know you and you getting to know us. And so I hope um, this is helpful. We, we do encourage you, um, when we don't have an evaluation sheet, um, I really would encourage you um, at the end to send us an email of whether this was useful for you, what are some things that we done better, what we can wish you would ask that you didn't know. So there's at the end of the PowerPoint um, a way that you can reach out to us either via the web or info at cfmtr.org, um, which is where we collect most of the kind of general information about um, some of the questions that people want about us as well as our phone number. So let's just kind of um, dig right in with introductions from you all because we don't know who, every, we know some of you all in the room, but we don't know everyone. So let's start with Good morning. My name is Steve Riley. I'm with Potomac Community Resources, and we provide 
educational, social, and respite care programs for teens and adults with developmental disabilities. Tom Howarth, I'm the director of the Father <coughs> Tennis Center, located on the Gonzaga High School campus. And we provide hypothermia seat um, uh, services during the cold weather months, a drop-in center for homeless men, we run a food pantry, and we also have a rent utility assistance program. I'm Penny Fletcher, I'm CEO of the Lucas Foundation we're in the process of uh, transforming all our patient services into a Lucas patient navigation program that's unique in the country. Good morning, my name is Lee Crenshaw, I'm with the Institute for Local Trust Alliance and we provide research and technical assistance to promote environmental and equitable and um, environmental Lynn Alward, BC Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy. We work to prevent teen pregnancy in BC. Our goal right now is to cut the rate in half by 2015. I'm Leslie Chalmer, the Executive Director of Mountain Project, the National Lesbian Health Organization based in Washington, DC. Yes, we do a bunch of things. We provide navigation services and volunteer services to lesbian, bisexual women with cancer. We do educational programming. We increase the cultural competency of doctors, nurses, and social workers work with the LGBT population and we do work on educational outreach to the lesbian community about their health needs. Thank you. I'm Chris Stacy from Sapphire Consulting and we provide development and social services to a variety of nonprofits in the area. So let's dig right into the 
our work, um, and I'm not going to read all of this, but it's some of it, sort of the things that we value. We seek, we really seek to grow and preserve the philanthropic um, capital in this region. Um, we are an organization that prides itself on providing stellar customer service to our donors as well as to our nonprofit uh, partners. We like to put our stake in the ground on issues that we care about and that we feel that are important to this community. Um, we are certainly interested in being a good steward of the monies that we manage and the monies that we invest out. Um, and again, I talked about us seeking to create change. And finally, um, the really important to all of you, we totally understand that our impact is directly linked to the investments that we make, is directly linked to the work that you all do, um, and that we cannot do this alone. And so we depend a lot on good nonprofit partners doing really good work to show our donors um, why they need to invest more in groups like you all and invest in this region. Um, some of our, um, you can keep going. <laughs> so we are um, uh, larger than a grant maker. And I would say, because our discretionary resources are somewhat limited, a good amount of our work and um, uh, probably the value is larger than the amount of money that we put out. So in addition to grant making, we do a lot of leveraging for this community. So for example, we participated in several federal grant um, proposals last year that netted millions of dollars in security uh, in, uh, in stimulus dollars for workforce development for this region where our staff led some of the writing. Um, we also are um, the fiscal agent for a couple of federal workforce development and job opportunities. And so just to just for, so that you know that we are we do a little bit more than just give grants away. We do a lot of work in capacity building, which Amina and um, Anna can talk about a little later. Uh, we are um, seen as a neutral convener in this region, so we'll see lots of meetings that we host uh, that may or may not be directly tied to our framework, but we do it because we believe that it's important that people have a place to come and talk about how to build community. Um, we commission research. Uh, not often, but to the extent that we do, uh, we are able to do that, we, we will do that. Uh, we do a lot of work with our donors on engaging them on what's happening in this community. So they get to know you and make those investments in you. And then some technical assistance advising. And we also are an organization, um, unlike many philanthropic organizations, where we will um, do advocacy. We are a 501c3 public charity. We have a board that has adopted an advocacy platform and guidelines for which we will join others in advocacy efforts and or do advocacy efforts on our own. <coughs> to the extent possible and allowable, obviously, under the IRS regulations. So, um, we're not a foundation that shies away from, from signing on to letters. And as a matter of fact, last year we invested, or the last three years, we have invested in regional efforts to preserve local funding for safety net services, some of which may be recipients of some of those dollars. What's going into So we spent the better part of last year, the staff and the board and a few other folks, thinking about the work that we're currently doing and what was important for us to um, help unify this large body of work that we were doing at a regional level as well as at a local level. And we landed on these three core issue areas, which are not new to us, but new in the sense that we are focusing um, our discretionary resources on these things meaning that there will be things that we will not fund um, or that we will have to have a really good um, answer to why we're funding things outside of this frame. So the three core issue areas are education, workforce development, and the safety net, and we'll dig a little bit deeper. I'm not going to go into a lot of details on the direct strategies, um, but I will tell you a little bit about the goals that we have. Um, we certainly understand these <coughs> issues are complex, they're connected, and so none of these things can take by themselves. The next slide um, gives you our view of, Andrew, of why we're doing this. You have a question? I'm sorry, go ahead. you want to take questions as we go, or what do we have? Um, I've got a couple more slides, and then we'll take questions. Is that OK? Unless it's pressing, you just want some clarification. OK. So um, we talked about our mission. And, and one of the things that wasn't on one of these slides is, is um, what we talked about as a vision. And it is that everyone in this region have the opportunity so at the top of our framework is economic security. And that's the, that's the thing, that's what's driving these three issues up, and that is the thing that we seek to 
to change that we see in this region. And so at the bottom of our framework is our work in the safety net space. And that really is about ensuring that there is a safety net or equitable distribution of safety net services across the region when people need them. Uh, and so we will be doing some work this year. We're commissioning um, a study, although it's a laudable effort. <laughs> We're commissioning a study on uh, gaps in the homeless in the homeless issue in the, in the region. So from <coughs> emergency shelter to affordable housing. We will be releasing the RFP for that shortly, and, uh, and a research firm will pick it up. And the whole, our hope is that we'll be able to use that study to guide our investment going forward. We have done, um, last or the past three years, invested a good amount in homelessness services. And what we know, based on the applications that we got, is that it's not equitable across the region, and there are uh, gaps along this continuum. No way going to be um, an exhaustive study, um, but to the extent that we can get information and, and, and know what's going on, um, we'd like to do that. Our funding partner with this particular effort is the Kaplan Foundation, and uh, we're working with a few other funders um, to get this off the ground. In the education space, uh, we are particularly interested in making sure that kids graduate um, from high school ready to avail themselves of post-secondary opportunities, whatever it is that they choose, whether it's two-year college, four-year college, apprenticeship, that they get something after high school. Um, and we are focusing in on the term disconnected youth. You've heard other people say opportunity youth. I think you understand disconnected youth while it's not necessarily a positive word. But we're focusing on those kids that are not working and not in school to see if we can do something about that. And then in the workforce development space, we are particularly interested in increasing the number of folks in this region that have post-secondary credentials. So we invest a good amount in um, workforce development efforts that align with community colleges and other certification programs. And more often than not, again, you can probably chime in, we will not invest in programs that don't have a connection to some kind of certification. Because what we know is that that this is a knowledge-based economy, and if you don't have something after high school, your chances of moving up uh, a career ladder is less likely. Yep. Um, so we're going and to- Just to add real quickly to that, I think the really important frame for this is that it's not just the certification that we're looking for, but it's an in-demand certification. So right. is there an actual high-quality job with a good paying salary at the end of the day that's gonna be the outcome of this? So if there's in-demand industry certifications and a job at the end of the day, we're interested in learning about that. And I would add that in some ways, that's changing the dynamic and the culture of how workforce development funding has happened historically. Um, so we're not just going to pop this on people, but really to also provide some technical assistance on how you might get to that uh, as well. Uh, next slide. These are just the goals that I just um, went over that are, you know, kind of philanthropy speak, uh, wonky kind of, but it really is. But there's explicit goals that we're seeking to achieve in each of these um, initiatives. Behind this general frame are a core set of strategies, which are not in this PowerPoint, um, as well as a good amount of data um, um, that we're tracking um, to, to track the health of this community. Um, but if you have any questions about this, I'll, I'll stop now. This is pretty much the last part of the, the uh, presentation. Okay, I have two questions. My first question is, in terms of communication, um, we communicate so far with you through grant requests. How can we perfect the, under, the knowledge that you have of what we do? So we'll get to that in one second. Um, let me see if we can the last slide. So these are just general things that I, and one of the questions, the questions have been getting in here as well. I pulled these together based on questions that people often ask me um, kind of out of the blue and thought these were kind of general questions. So the first thing is, do I have to be a 501c3 organization? Uh, to be eligible for grants, yes, you do, and or sponsored by a 501c3 organization. So you can have a fiscal agent. Um, Faith-based institutions are a little bit outside of that scope, so we have funded some faith-based organizations who are not 501c3 organizations, but for the most part, you do have to have a product, but have a 501c3. Should I send an unsolicited proposal? Um, 
So on the information side, it's important for us to know about you. So it is important for me to get your newsletter quarterly. I would not say don't send stuff to me every week. I mean, I, I get lots of information, and what I do with that to the extent possible is I create files for each of the groups that I meet with. Um, and we're trying to get better at having our database um, to a point where everybody can access all of the vast amount of information about the group that we meet with. I would not say spend your time, don't spend your time writing a 10-page unsolicited proposal. It's important for us to know who you are, what your mission is, what your target population is, and generally what your impact has been in the past year or so. Um, it's not important for me to get your videos, your, um, at this point, um, just in an unsolicited way, um, participant testimonials. I, I'm trying to <coughs> minimize the amount of work that you have to do getting us information. So um, you'll see at the end of the slide, end of the PowerPoint, there's an email that says info at CSSTR. If you want to dump information there or if you want to send information directly to me or one of the staff, um, that would be fine as well. But I do encourage you to send us general information that can be electronic that I can move over easily to a um, computer file. Um, the question that I get all the time that I really want folks to understand is how can I meet with your donor? And what I will say off the bat is that there is no formal way for you to request a meeting with a donor. Um, typically what happens is a donor will say I'm interested in X and our staff will do a, a good amount of due diligence, and then we will call you and say, we have X donor that may be anonymous or not. Um, can we set up a site visit with you? Um, we push a lot of information out to our donors, um, and we push a lot of information out about the groups that we know um, to donors that, may, that we know. Let's say, for example, you know, you just a really good, like weird example. A donor that's interested in building playgrounds made out of cups Yogurt cups, right? Cups with yogurt cups. And rebuilding New Orleans, and they want to do it with it in an environmentally sustainable way. This is close to singing. They call us up and say, "What do you got?" <laughs> oh, that really happened. That really happened. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you were like, oh, we get all kinds of stuff. We get really Period. interesting. But stuff. we get lots of requests like that all the time. Yeah. You know, my grandkids are really passionate about this, and we've been talking about that over Thanksgiving. I'd like a couple of ideas when we get together for the holidays. What have you heard in this area, this area, that? And that goes well beyond our community leadership frame for our discretionary giving. Right. And that's why it's vital to have information on everything that you're you're doing. Not a 10 page proposal, but just something so that way we can follow up. Right. And we'll say, you know what? I actually did hear about this organization that's starting the program for female vets. Or I just heard about this organization that's doing this innovative program with the homeless in DC. And, um, a question that we get all the time is, if my proposal is denied, who can I call to get information from or feedback? And you should call, primarily you should call the program officer if the program officer is listed. If the program officer isn't listed, you can call me and I can figure out who reviewed your proposal and didn't see that. <coughs> it isn't, nine times out of ten, or eight times out of ten, it's because of limited resources, not because it was a poorly written proposal or a bad idea, it's just that we have limited, limited dollars um, to give out and we just can't get to everybody that we would like to. Um, what criteria do you use to determine which organizations to recommend to a donor? Um, and they're general. We look at the leadership of the organization, um, and that's the leadership of the, of the exec executive level as well as the board. Um, we are um, not likely to recommend an organization that have a really strong executive director and a really good board um, because the two kind of go hand look at financial management, and we try to look at financial management, um, you know, finance is a lot heavier than we have in the past, because uh, it's a little rocky, but we don't, you know, we don't say if you don't have a reserve, you know, that's hard, you're not stable. So we just kind of look at how you are managing your money, if you've made some um, contingencies because things are a little tight, um, if you have um, some good answers to what happens if you don't get the full request that you have for how you're going to alter the project. And that you're also being responsible. So we use an audit if it's required, and or your nine ninety six. We also look at your program, obviously, and your program outcomes. If you're able to clearly 
articulate um, what's been your impact in the past year, two years, three years, not just the numbers of people that you serve. So um, you can say, you know, we passed out, um, I'm using an example, 500 bags of food, um, but if you have a good sense of what did that do for the family that you're working with, that would be important for us. You know, because we like to tell our donor, I mean, you know, folks like to connect with people. And fundraising is all about relationship building and who, you know, what, what is it that grabs at people's hearts as well as their heads, but what's good and best for them. And so they want to know more than the numbers. They want to know the face behind those numbers as well. And finally, are there any current funding opportunities? And I struggled with this a little bit, and I did say it earlier. Because we are a relatively complex organization, we rarely have um, open grant rounds. So you will rarely see on our website, and if it happens, we'll send you a wee blast that says there's an open grant round. Most of our grant rounds are by solicitation only, and that has to do with the fact that they're usually very focused, um, and the resources are limited. And so um, it, it doesn't help you or us to send us a proposal um, that is likely not to get funded if we made it open. And I'll give you an example. We just had a last, we just had a grant round for workforce development under an initiative called Accelerating Advancement. <coughs> and I met with a prospective grantee, um, not for this round, but for something else. And they told me that they were going to apply for this round. <coughs> and I said, well, let me just say this. It's highly unlikely, given what I know about the organization, that you're going to get funded for this round because it's very focused and you're not really a workforce development organization and from what I know about you, you don't really fit. And they said, well, we thought because it's a two-year grant opportunity, it's a good, you know, good grant round. And um, some funders may not tell you that, but I kind of felt it important that I didn't want this organization to go back and spend, you know, 10 hours writing this proposal that I knew it was almost 90% given who I knew were going to apply that, that fit and meet these conditions. So I really would encourage you to look at um, the grant rounds, uh, look at the, the criteria, and, and really pay attention to the RFP um, to see if you fit into it. Um, there's a sheet that um, some of our staff developed on some tips that are, I think, common sense for the most part, but one of them is we recognize it's a really tight funding environment. Um, but use your development resources wisely in terms of where you're going to go after dollars. Um, um, that's generally my kind of ask, uh, take frequently asked questions that I always get, but just you know, open for whatever you guys want to ask us. Um, almost anything. We'll answer almost anything as honestly as we possibly can. I would just add, there's some th things that we definitely don't want to see, like a one-person board or two-person board. That's that's not going to fly. A board as your mom and your cousin, no, not so much. We've seen these before. So yeah, no, we really have. I think um, I don't know what else for money. What are we, what are we looking for? I mean. Uh, a strong thing that we also look at is we want to look at diversity on your board. We're talking about race and ethnic diversity as well as the diversity of kind of the background that the board brings. So if you're a group that's a youth development group that does after school tutoring, we want to make sure that you have um, people who are from the field of education. We have people who can maybe from business fields that can actually help, can really help you when it comes to fundraising. Um, uh, so there's that content experience and, and, and background and support as well as the financial support. Um, I think um, 
in transition, having a transition Absolutely. plan and sustainability for your board is really important. So if you have a board of five people and they've all been on your board for 10 years, that's going to be a red flag for some of us. We want to see people with board terms and, and real roles and responsibilities and, and be very strategic and, and aware of what, what your board members are, are doing and like how they work. That's good. And then, yeah. There are prevention strategies as well as intervention in that education arena. It's sort of from the cradle all the way to 25. What are all the steps that we need to do to make sure that kids get the support that they need to show up at school ready to learn on the first day, get through it, get all the academic support that they need, get all the enrichment, the leadership skills, get the help getting into college, everything that they need so that way when they graduate and go on to another potential, uh, to pursuing another potential, they're really prepared. I would also add that our donors are, that this framework that we, it's, it's, it's our staff-driven experience <coughs> framework. Our donors are interested in everything under the sun. Um, and in the education space, they pretty much fund everything, um, at early care all the way through uh, scholarships for college. Um, so it's very diverse. Uh, so if you've got information you want to pass along, those would be useful to pass along. So I'll hand over here and then we'll I just had a question, and this kind of goes sort of hand in hand with the, the, the board competency um, in terms of what you look at, or that's impressive. Um, what do you look at in terms of staff leadership at the executive director level and, and everything else? Because our executive director has only been with the organization for about nine months. I've only been there a year in July. Um, and we, we have one housing counselor who's been there for a while, and another housing counselor that was just hired. So we have a fairly new staff and so as far as leadership and you know so we look at the history of the organization we understand staff transitions right. happen and they happen all the time we want to be aware of them right. like you know we'd like not to find out for granted that we're funding three months later that the executive and this has happened the executive director left and we came to support their leadership development and coaching <laughs> <laughs> we'd like to not find that out after the fact so it'd be nice just to give us a heads up but we understand transitions happen and to the extent that we can be helpful so we have supported executive transitions before we have supported coaching in our capacity building work we have supported um, staff development in a particular one organization where that i can recall where there was an internal person moving up so we supported a coach for that person so I think too when we talk about leadership, that's why we talk about it in those two in those two those two pieces of it, the, the kind of senior team or the executive leadership or the staff as well as the board. Because in a case like that, one of the things I would look for is how is the board supporting the organization through this transition? Um, is there and not that it has to be, is there a connection between the person who's outgoing? Um, and the new people that are coming in, are they still connected to the organization? Not that, it, that it's not a necessary thing. Sometimes it just makes it easier for continuity's sake and, and moving the organization forward. And then also, just about any time, we do support with other foundations as well, other small foundations. And one of our, one of our uh, I won't call it a principle, one of, but one of the things that we always do is, this, is that during the review period, if there is a staff, staff transition, we make sure we meet with the organization. We either do a site visit or we have them come in. We do something to make sure that we understand how is the flow of the organization going, you know, since you got this big change happening. funds are funds that the uh, community foundation that's your own fund 
and then there's the additional funds that donors might make available through you. Yeah, so I'll make it a little bit more complicated. And okay. Then we've got um, several uh, uh, funds um, that we, we, we staff the grant making for donors. Mm -hmm. Some of them are anonymous. Uh, so Lonnie runs a grant making program with a private foundation called the Marquette Foundation, where mm -hmm. we are the staff, and they are a non staff foundation. Mm -hmm. um, so discretionary ones are the ones that we totally control, if you will, and influence the most. And then, our, then there are donors who know exactly who they want to give to, their alma mater, their nonprofit. And they do it through and you. they do it through us. Right. Um, so if you've ever gotten, many of you probably have gotten checks from the Kennedy Foundation and we've not ever met you before, it means the donor already knows who you are. And they basically fill out a donor suggestion form and tell us, give it to Salvation Army. And we do that. We check you out and make sure you're, you are in business and that you're a 501c3, and then our board approves those grants on a monthly basis. So the 52 million, though, that are out in the community, 52 million of grants in 2011, is that everything that's that your everything. discretion? And that's the majority of that is, is donor. Roughly, could you say how much your discretionary Mostly, funds were in last year, I did this, just did this figure across everything, including, um, so we rerun a couple of funding collaboratives where funders come together and pool their dollars. So we have a workforce collaborative and a collaborative with Prince George's County. Um, we have a couple of funds that we manage for donors that we include in the discretionary pot because we influence them. Probably about six million. So okay. that includes us, nice. Montgomery County, Prince George's, um, and district. Thank you. I think one other thing to say about that number too is just like Angela said, our donors give to any and everything and one of the things that we try to do in meeting and talking with them is influence donors to give in this area. So it doesn't matter if their uh, interests are you know, within our framework. If they are interested in animal protection, then we want them to do animal protection in the region as much as possible. I think last year our number was about, in terms of the percentage that stayed right. in the region, was about 63%. Uh, so of that total, not that, that total, 52 million was right. this region. Yeah, the, um, it, they can give you know, all over the world. They like to Harvard if that's their alma mater. They can give internationally, um, but but our job is to encourage them to give here. So the donors can be from anywhere, and they can give anywhere. They're, like yeah, is there any kind of where the majority regional? of them are from here? Okay. So the majority of them live and or work right, in this region. Mm -hmm. Connection to this community. And I promise last question, but are there any big donors who are important donors who aren't from this area who just decided for whatever reason because their grandmother used to live here or something like that? But are there like national organizations yes. who are I'll give you one mind. example. So uh, we have a fund that was set up as a bequest from a couple that passed away a couple of years ago. And their kids are scattered around the country. And their parents were very involved in the civic life in Montgomery County. And they set up this fund as an endowment and every year it's got a 5% payout. And what they wanted is their kids to alternate one kid per year, picks which organizations they're going to give to. And the idea is they give some money in Montgomery County where they grew up and a little in their hometown, so to wherever they are now, their new hometown. Mm -hmm. So that way they can start to make their stamp wherever they are and have their parents' name continue. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm talking with the one in, in uh, California, and last year I was talking to the one in Colorado. And, and there are local ones, you know, and, and one of them, she's, she said, well, I'm going to make uh, an effort to come into the region, and I want to meet all these organizations we've been supporting. And so she wants to go around site visits when she comes back for Thanksgiving to visit her sister. And, you know, so it, it really varies. Okay. It all depends on the family. We say, you know, if you've met one, you met one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't say was that in this region, there are four or five community foundations, so there is a community. There's the Baltimore Community Foundation, there's the Howard County Community Foundation, there's a Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill Community Hill. Foundation, there's um, which the one? Anne Arundel uh, Community Foundation. We are not affiliated, so there is no um, like governing body like the United Way, where everybody you know, signs on and becomes a United Way organization. We're similar, but we're not affiliated. To the extent that we can work together, we will. 
we are the largest in the region in terms of asset size. Baltimore, I think, is right up next to us. Um, but in terms of the other ones, uh, we're pretty, pretty much the largest. And question here, and then I'm missing my count, but I can keep two minutes. So I want to check on a couple of themes tied in with workforce development and education. Uh, two of the things that I've seen in, in Montgomery County, one, very few high schools have vocational programs, and we see that as critical uh, so that if people can have have enough vocational training as they leave high school, they're in a better position to get jobs. And so I want to ask you about that. And the, the other thing we're seeing an important program is the truancy program to keep kids in school because a lot of them dropping out of school and then they've got real problems. I'm wondering to what extent those two themes fit in with some of the things that you're looking at. I can speak to the workforce piece a little bit more cogently and then maybe a little bit on the truancy side. I, I totally agree with you. Vocational education, career technical education is a huge priority for us. Um, uh, since we've developed this framework that Angela laid out, we are really trying to link education and workforce development to make sure that there's seamless service delivery for young people. Uh, when we talk about post-secondary credentials or post-secondary certifications, we aren't just talking about a two-year or four-year college degree. We're talking about anything that's going to get a young person to that next stage in their life. So we are definitely in conversations with a lot of folks around this region in terms of how we can support vocational education, career and technical education. We just had a great meeting in Montgomery County a couple of weeks ago uh, that touched on some of this stuff and some great things that are going to be happening up there. So yes, on that one. Uh, truancy, definitely a huge problem for us. Uh, especially here in the district, but I think every, every school system is, is facing that. Um, when we talk about disconnected youth as a potential frame for us to move forward with and focus some of our energy and efforts on, truancy is one of the top line issues that we're going to be working on. So uh, again, it's, it's going to be big, big for us. great things about working with Commonwealth and Job Opportunities Task Force, they aren't from our region. They're from you know Baltimore and from Richmond, respectively, but they're very connected to state-level policy, which has such a huge impact on local policy. What So part of our investment strategy in choosing those organizations is to try and connect local advocates around workforce development to what's happening on a state level. So if you have a particular interest around workforce development, advocacy, policy, and stuff, definitely tag me after the meeting, and maybe I can connect you to them and, and see if we can wrap it up. And I would also so, say that um, partnership of Prince George's does a lot of funding in advocacy, or relatively a lot in advocacy, trying to build the capacity, the advocacy capacity in Prince George's County, and so we're also looking at some local work to that extent in Prince George's as well. I think one of the things, and I like to blow our horn whenever whenever I can, I think along with Ben, we have uh, one of our other staff people who isn't in the room right now, Sarah Oldmixon, is like, workforce development guru, brainiac, 
super duper lady mm -hmm. in this stuff who comes with a whole lot of experience and also has really moved our work in workforce development forward in the, well, she's been here for four years, just shot it forward, um, you know, and has done an outstanding job. So we've been able to, to leverage a lot of support both on the advocacy side and, uh, as Angela mentioned earlier, a lot, of, uh, a lot of funding support has been able to come from the ideas and the connections that she brought in helping us to move that work forward. Yeah. We also do, we, I'll, I'll mention first Tuesdays very quickly, we have a, a group of local workforce development policy advocates here in the district that we convene on a monthly basis called First Tuesdays group because they meet the first Tuesday of every month. Um, so if you're working in that space, I can try and connect you to that as well. I know that Dawn over at LISC is um, a part of that group, so definitely have some connections with you guys in the room already on that. And those are things, I mean, first Tuesdays, I think we just started out doing it and saying, how can we have an impact with a low-cost kind of, and so for us, we provide a lot of in the space, but out of that group have come two to three really significant issue groups that have worked to move some policy improvements in the workforce system in the district, and so um, I just want to harp on that point that where we can't, where we don't have lots of you know, grant dollars, we do try to use and be creative about the resources that we do have to move town Rochester. Um, and uh, this group has been meeting for the better part of a year, or a little... About two years, two actually. Two years now. So anyway, um, and we're trying to figure out if there's a way to replicate that same kind of dynamic in other parts of the region. Um, so in Prince George's County, we're looking at that. Here. Oh, okay. yep. I'm sorry, this is, I cannot change the power. I'm not that technically savvy, and I do not know why it is. No. <laughs> but our website, if you get a prize, if you can read it. www.thecommunityfoundation.org, um, and the, the email, just send a general info, it's info at cfncr.org, but everyone has a card, so if you uh, want their card afterwards, and this is just our general number that you can give to everyone in your system, including our affiliates. So the question that I had was, We may receive um, gifts from that we don't know. Is there a way to get them information? You know, keep them updated. Um, or, you know, the work that I mean, if they, if generally, it's, it's so. Uh, what I will say is that we've got a bunch of audiences, and um, our primary or target audiences are donors, and we 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 provide services to them, and and then after that, everybody else is our is our audience. So if they ask for it. Um, if they ask for it in there, generally they will give us some instructions on whether they want a final report, or and that'll be in your award letter that comes. Um, if they choose to be known, we'll let you know who they are. I have to understand they don't. You may only know their name and nothing else about them, but we don't generally release information about them um, unless they allow it, and we don't send them random information unless they ask for it. Yeah, I mean one of the things that. Uh, we have the regional affiliates in Prince George's County and Montgomery County, and then recently we started these things that we call offices. So there's DC, and then there's work that's going on in Northern Virginia. And the idea is to make sure that we have really strong relationships with our donors in those areas. So if you received a grant from somebody, you don't know it's from, I don't know, JoJo's Fund, there's probably, whatever the name of the fund is, contact, just send, if you want to send a thank you or, or an acknowledgement in some kind of way, just send it back to the office, and what we'll do is, the person who's responsible for the team that that donor is on will we'll contact the donor and find out what she or he wants to do. So we're in touch with the donors a lot. And typically, you know, we do look at what's in their funds, what they've been funding, to kind of guide the conversation that we're having with them. Um, so we will know if you know we're meeting with X donor whether they funded you or not by another mm -hmm. and and um, we'll say you know anything you funded, so and so last month. If you'd be interested in more information, if that's if we can. You know, we can help guide a conversation, but we don't do it typically unsolicited unless mm -hmm. we know the donors already do it. So I my two questions. Sure. Yeah. The first question is, if, if you have a donor uh, who we don't know and we don't want to do the research to find out who they are, um, that says, I want to give money to a faith-based organization that's providing direct services to the homeless. I know this has happened because very grateful for the support we've gotten from the Yes. But, so the key person there is the person who answers the phone at the community foundation. If 
that being the case, if things are in a period of change for your organization, how can we ensure that the person answering the phone here from the donor knows enough about the change that we're going through to be able to recommend? So the person that answers the phone is our receptionist up here, and she sh generally, if there is a community-related question, she sends it to me. And then I become the kind of, who does it, who does it need to get to? To the extent possible that I don't have you or a donor talking to five different people, I will do the, what information do I need to find for this gentleman or this, and then get back to you. And that is typically how we try to operate, so that I'm not saying, well, you know what, why don't you call the line? And the line says, oh, you know what, why don't you call Sydney? Or you, because it, you will never get your answer. Um, we are going through a little bit of a transition. Um, we have downsized to some small degree, um, and that is a really good question. But the, but the receptionist, literally nine times out of ten. If I can answer your question, I will, and if I can forward it to someone else or get the answer for you, I'll do that as well. Good. Number two, when something happens in the region where a certain coalition for homeless advocates, for example, knows there's a problem, and we wouldn't need support from a broader organization or the, the capacity of the guru in the safety net area. Um, for example, a concrete example is the Washington Post recently reported about the practice that if a family goes to the city and says, I need housing for myself and my three kids, and um, the, the city will say to them, do you, would you have absolutely no alternative? You have no cousin, nobody else that can take you in? If you say yes, you trigger an inquiry from the Child Protective Services. If you don't want to do that, and you don't want to run that risk, you simply don't ask. That seems to me to be an embarrassment, and like my friend Patty Gutierrez, the legal critic says, an outrage. Mm -hmm. So what do you, how do we deal with outrages? I can tell you pretty well, and just want to give you a sense of my background. Before coming to the Community Foundation, I um, ran a local nonprofit um, a short stay after school, which was called NCS, and I was still with Alex for nine years as executive director. So I know the policy space and the DC policy arena very well. Uh, just give us a call. I mean, I, I don't know whether um, we might be able to talk through some strategy or whether, you know, our staff don't come here as grant majors. So they pretty much have all, no one is born a grant major. We, you know, we learn that as a part of being here. Most of us have had a vast amount of experience in the nonprofit sector and, and in this region. And so um, utilize us as well for the um, intellectual capital that we have here in the strategizing. Uh, because we have funded some, under the ground is not the right word, but we have funded a few groups to do some advocacy work. Um, some of which is not so popular necessarily. Um, but like we were a huge supporter um, several years before I joined the foundation on immigration uh, immigration issues and funded a lot of day laborer work, funded a lot of work in North Virginia around immigration, which was not really popular then and still not popular now. Um, but all I can say is that reach out to us for, and if we can help you, we will. If we can talk through some things, you know, we do know a lot of people, and, and there may be groups that we might be able to connect you to to form a local coalition, or if there's some. Um, advising that we can do. We also, so on the leveraging side, uh, we do often call upon our institutional funding partners as national and local to leverage resources from them. So as an example, we leveraged a grant from the Mott Foundation to support um, some capacity building for an effort called ACC, which is um, a cradle to career initiative to create system alignment We weren't able to give a grant ourselves. We called our colleague and said, look, we need this to happen. Can you give money to us? So we could do that as well. So I think there are a bunch of options. Just, just give us a call. We did 
do, you know, we push as much information that we that we're interested in, we think our donors in, are interested in, so we can probably do that. Um, we're working on some projects now that may do a little bit more pushing out of what's happening in the street. Um, and so if you got if you, if there's interesting information that we can pass along to our donors, uh, we will do that. Sydney is going to be working on that. Katie's going to be working on some of that. So we have some information that you might want to know. I'll just one. Angela, can I say something to that too? I think the important thing, to, like like you said, our world, our work with our donors is to try to share information as much as possible on issues that are critical in the region, and there are a number of them. So we do a number. We used to do a monthly newsletter. I think we altered that now, and there were different topics that we chose. That were some of them were really germane to just our community leadership focus, and some of them were broader topics or topics outside of that that we've done. And then there's also um, there are also times when we do almost like these informational sessions for donors based on based on things that have happened. I know recently there was one, um, there was a donor forum that happened in Montgomery County that was around resources in Montgomery County for disconnected youth, and that was uh, something that we reached out to a number of organizations that are supported in Montgomery County to bring them together to talk about their work. We do site visits to different groups and, and groups of groups to talk about different issues as well. So there's, there's ways that we can promote the issues, but it's kind of a fine line between promoting the issues and trying to do what could be considered fundraising for another organization. We don't do that. Um, so if it gets too dicey, <laughs> we're like, mm, no. But I just want to piggyback. exposed to that press release so that not only does it go out to the donors but it goes out to the broader community. One of the things that we're doing in the county is July 19th, we actually have a, a nonprofit expo. So we get a chance to introduce the organizations that are doing work in the county to funders and donors and policy makers, etc. <laughs> and we I don't and we have that idea. It's something that we're thinking about doing because that's what our deal is mentioned the Leno's Leadership Award, if you've not gotten an e-blast that says that our RCR nomination process has started to celebrate unsung heroes in our community, uh, please go on our website and nominate somebody that you really think deserves this award. We get four awards a year, um, and each of those awards are cash awards. I may, get the, I may have the, the makeup wrong, but it's a $5,000 total cash award. Three thousand goes to the individual, and two thousand goes to the nonprofit of their choice. So I may be, I may have it backwards, but either way, it's a five thousand cash award. The nominations are due July twentieth, and we will um, finalize the process by October and announce those awardees at our day on December fifteenth. Um, am I did I miss someone that around here that had their hand up? Oh, over here, did I miss you? Uh, yes. Okay. We'll look. You answered my question. So okay. When we talk about, Angela mentioned this effort that we're starting to, to work around called Raise DC. Mm -hmm. That's specifically looking at how to support young people from before preschool all the way through post-secondary. What we've identified in concert with the mayor and a lot of other agencies is really some large buckets of work that all come in underneath that, that frame. And health is definitely a determining factor for how a young person is going to be able to so we're definitely on the same page with you that it's something that we have to focus on. Um, it's not something that, that I think that we focus a lot of our own discretionary resources to addressing and tackling, and that's just a scope issue. We can't we can't be in all places with, with, with the amount of money that we have to uh, available to us. But it's, it's definitely a determining factor that, that we're um, that we're trying to figure out how to more effectively tackle with the resources that we do have. Last year we were able to measure some money from Kaiser Permanente. Grant round to focus on mental health um, and support youth for folks who were dealing with economic crisis. Um, but it was a really unique kind of opportunity that came 
up that Kaiser wanted to fund and they kind of funded it through us, um, but I would say it's not typical. Um, I, do, I would say that there is recognition in the local funding community that mental health and children's mental health is important and that the um, Washington Reef Association of Grant Makers, the children, youth, and families working group spent a good amount of time last year learning and talking about mental health needs of kids um, mm -hmm. in the region. Uh, so there are a good number of local funders and if you haven't been connected to the Consumer Health Foundation, they're another big local funder that does a lot of work in that space and we're, we're close allies. And potentially, I would say reach out to Kaiser Permanente as well. Some of them um, do staff, and so some of them, they operate like a traditional, we have a nonprofit donor, and that they operate like a traditional foundation, and that they've got a round that comes out with the <coughs> proposal. There are some that give, you know, once a year. There are lots of them that give around. We are really busy around Christmas. So like everyone else, it's our big year for fundraising. It's our big, the big time of year for fundraising, but it's also the big time of year that we get kids out the door. No, I would say there's a typical kind of way that they give. It's just this, you know, I had a donor email me over the weekend and say, oh, I, didn't, I don't remember my donor sent so long and I want to give money to X organization. How can I do it? Right. I mean, one of the things we were, we were talking to, I'm right. sorry, no, we were talking to, uh, uh, my, uh, Mark Hanson, who's our CFO, and I had a meeting and we were talking about one of the, I think one of the greatest tools that we have for our donors is what uh, Angela just mentioned, it's called Donor Central. And it's an online portal where they can go on, they can get access to information that's in their fund, and then that's how they can make grant recommendations. A lot of people do it late at night. I get notifications when it comes in, and they get to a point where my wife was like, shut that damn phone up. <laughs> so I had to turn my phone off. But And they come in all, 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 all the time. Like every every month or yeah just about every month we have an executive committee meeting right something like that almost every month and every month there's a batch of grants that have to be approved by the executive committee and that ranges from i think a low number would be about 200 um to when we get towards the end of the year which is granting and giving season which is like seven eight hundred that may come in in december alone but they run the it's the little A lot of families do this to consolidate their giving. There are some that really love it because it's instead of them having to write 20 checks at the end of the year and collect all of those receipts, they put all the money in their one community foundation fund and call us up for the receipts, and it's done from an accountant's perspective. But then they've got this nice consolidated format where they can go in and they've got their grant history and they can just punch in all the information and it achieves the same result. They're still supporting all the same organizations they did before. It's just consolidated. It's easier. It's less of a headache. And we have a lot of families that just function like that. So they'll get a newsletter, and they'll get a special request. Like, oh, OK, sure, I can give a little bit more. Or, oh, it's the holidays. I have to remember I've got to do this. Or, oh, there's a, you know, they've got this special uh, capital campaign coming up, and I, you know, I want to give to that. And, so it just it comes randomly, and just as random as all of your individual donors give, that's it's sort of a similar pattern. Okay. Two, then I'll go back. Okay. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, we should be thankful. But, 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 we, we, the, so 
we've got um, an affiliate in Prince George's County that is focused on the local needs of Prince George's County, and we have a partnership with Prince George's County and Ron, another grant round called National Harbor. Correct, the National Harbor. Harbor. Prince George's. And regionally, we make grants um, in Prince George's County as well. Um, I did a session, and I just want to give you an example. I did a session in Prince George's County when I first started, and the person said, do something similar. I've never gotten funded from the organization, so I'm not going to apply anymore. And I said to them, well, let me, I will guarantee you that you will not get it if you don't, if you don't apply. <laughs> All that to say is that, you know, it, it's helpful. Even if you apply, you get declined. We know who you are. We have reviewed your application. We have your information. Um, and it may mean that you have to up, keep applying before you, you know, and us can work with you and, and before you finally get it. There are thousands of nonprofits right. in the region. And um, go ahead. Yeah, no, we're about 4,000 nonprofit organizations in Prince George's County. So, for instance, for the last grant round for National Harbor, which will be announced again in the first part of August, we got 200 applicants and we ended up funding about 25. So the competition is really stiff. But I would suggest you do what Angela just said, is that continue to apply, reach out to us if you have questions about why you didn't get funding, we'll sit down and talk, talk that over with you. And then come in again for another request. And there have been many organizations who weren't funded the first year, who have funded the third year. So I wouldn't give up then. Yeah. I was going to say, you messed that order up. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, one of the things that it, at least I'm tasked with is for a long time for our donors in the district, like like we mentioned, we have uh, the affiliate offices in Prince George's County and Montgomery County, and the staff there have a lot of interaction with those donors that are kind of focused in those areas or based in those areas. And one of the one of the primary kind of things that I'm supposed to do as a DC person is to reach out to our donors who live and give, like I said, in the district to find out, to bring them into the fold more if they're not already in. Some of them want to, some of them don't, uh, to be honest. I mean, I have people who, I have a couple of donors who I've reached out to that kind of had this transactional relationship with us, and from I've been able to build really strong relationships with them where they're actually giving more directly to us, as well as giving more 
just in their own uh, areas of interest. And then I have others who uh, had a couple say, 